legendary platinum recording artist Mark Farner, an all-American frontman and guitarist of Grand Funk Railroad, is our special guest on episode 15, season 2 of Music Matters with Daryl Craig Harris. How you doing, Mark Farner? I'm doing good, Daryl. Uh, hey, we're- I'm, like I said, I'm I'm proud to be sucking air, and I, I'm after all that we've been through uh, as a world. Uh, yep. Don't feel too bad, buddy. Hey, I hear you, man. I hear you. Every day you wake up is a good day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so you're you're um, you said you're in the lower part of Michigan, right? Yeah, the lower peninsula. I'm a I'm a troll because I'm under the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, it's funny, you know, like Michigan. I know I know um, Grand Funk Railroad, which is the band. I guess you're obviously most well known for, but you also have your own your own group now. We're going to talk yeah. about. Um, but they, they're kind of known as a Flint band, right? Flint, Michigan. Yes, we were all from the Flint area. And Mel and I, the bass player and I, went to the same school together. Oh, awesome. Rode dirt bikes together. We uh, we drank beer together. We smoked pot together. We played <laughs> music together. <laughs> hey, there you go. That's a lot of, that's a lot of together. That's uh, a lot of together. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, so you guys are more like brothers than, than just bandmates, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Mel and I were, were always into the motorcycles and, and some something... We were very motion conscious. <laughs> oh, I got you. Yeah, man. So uh, that's kind of what what we did when we got together. We always, awesome. But he did it on a 650 BSA, dude, instead yeah. of a dirt bike. That was his dirt bike. Yeah, that's a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we grew up riding bikes too in, in California in the desert. It's so much, so much fun. I mean, it's so yeah. much fun. Um, how, how did you get interested in music and songwriting? How did that start for you? Well, I got interested when I was just a little guy growing up in Flint, Michigan. My mother moved uh, from Leechville, Arkansas to to Flint, Michigan when she was 16 years old. And the whole family came, aunts and uncles and my grandpa Cotton and uh, uncle. I mean, you know, when they got together, the voices were like angels. The women sang like angels and and Grandpa Cotton would be playing a banjo and somebody awesome. would be playing violin and somebody playing guitar. My dad blew saxophone and played guitar. But when those women sang, oh, mm-hmm. dear. Oh, man. It was like, it was just like angels, man. And us, us kids are that with our mouth hanging open, looking at these women and going, wow, listen to that. And then my mother showed my sister and I how to harmonize once we were older, you know, and, uh, and could sit down for a second, how to stick one finger in this ear and keep this one open to hear my voice. Right. And then, and let my sister sing in the other note. And then finally, at some point you take your finger away and whoa, we got harmony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause harmony is a whole different thing. It's singing lead, right? It's like oh, uh, yeah. so, somebody explained to me a long time ago, just think of it as a different melody. I'm like, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's, it's cool. And like, so your, your voice is just, I mean, it's awesome. I mean, we all know the hits and, and we've all heard those songs just a million times. Um, how did you get into songwriting? Was that kind of a, a process with the singing? It kind of worked hand in hand or? Well, I was in a band with Dick Wagner, um, who later became famous uh, as a guitar player in Alice Cooper's band. Oh, awesome. And the Frost and, uh, and Ursa Majors. He, he's he's a, a great musician from our area, but I was in his band called The Bossman and it was a show band. And we played a gig one night and he uh, lived in Saginaw in an apartment. We went up to the apartment and his wife and kids had gone to bed, of course. And uh, we just sat up with our electric guitars, not plugged in. Right. And he was showing me some chord inversions and what have you. And I just asked him, I said, Wagner, man, how do you write all of these songs? And he says, it's easy, Mark, it's inside of me just like it's inside of you. Yeah. He says, you, you can write songs. And I said, I can write songs? He said, yes, <laughs> you can, because it's in you, brother. I know you can. It, it's just a matter of time. Right. So he went to bed. I stayed up and I wrote Heartbreaker that night. Wow. Awesome. That, 
first song. Yeah, it's interesting. Like like you say, it's a sort of our superpower that we have to discover, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we all have that, but you, you also have to have the confidence that somebody like that kind of encouraging or mentoring you sometimes yeah. makes a difference. Oh, man, does it ever. It is a an encouraging thing, especially when you look up so much to the person who's giving you that clue, that little life clue. Right. Absolutely. How, how did, how did um, Grand Funk, what was the beginnings of that? Obviously, you guys went to school together. How did you guys decide to actually form that band? And I'm sure there was other bands before that, too, probably. But Yeah, the, the bass player and I went to school together, but the drummer was from a town, a suburb of Flint called Swartz Creek. His mother was a teacher out there. And uh, we were in a band that was being booked from Delta Promotions in Bay City. And they told us they had some gigs out on the East Coast. And if we could go out there and do some of these showcase things and show them what we could do, that we could go back to this area, Boston area, right. and make some money. So that was uh, that was the conditions we were leaving under. But boy, I'll tell you what, when we got out there, the worst uh, snowstorm in the history of the world hit Cape Cod, right where <laughs> these Flint, Michigan boys were staying. Yeah, there's nothing like touring in the wintertime. <laughs> uh, we were in summer cottages with just little one little gas space heater out in the living room, and all the pipes froze. The uh. crawl spaces all filled with water. It was bad. It was bad, bad, bad. We were melting down snow to drink <laughs> to make our oatmeal and that was the only thing we had for the last week we were there oatmeal with no milk no sugar no nothing <laughs> just but we were thankful to have the oatmeal right uh, but two of the guys in the band were married and by the time we had got back to flint michigan after this fiasco the wives were threatening divorce so uh they had to quit the band Right. We, yeah, we all we all know that story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so Brewer looks at me. So what are we gonna do? I said, dude, we should just form a three piece band, and and let's not get anybody that's married. <laughs> you know, <laughs> keep the women out of this because they just yeah. bad. You know. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough. I mean, like, you know, we all we all know. I mean, of course, I, I'm, I've been a musician for a bunch of years, too. And it's like, hey, honey, I'm going to go on the road for four weeks. You deal with the kids. I'll be back later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, they all love that. <laughs> <laughs> so when you guys um, you guys get together, you start, I guess, were you originally a cover band and then became an original band? Or did it start off as an original group? No, it's we were doing covers. We were doing all kinds of, uh, we would do the rascals, you know. It's yeah. a beautiful morning, you know. All uh, the good songs, yeah. Yeah, and and people loved it because we had a band that could sing the parts, and right. and the people if if you could make it sound like the record, man, the people would just flood the dance floor. Right. So, that's what we did. Uh, but w I was writing after I was with uh, Dick Wagner. I was writing then, and. Um, after we did decided we we're going to make a three piece band, we, uh, we would go to the Flint Federation of Musician Hall and get in there. And these guys are, I'd place a little bit of some of the stuff that I had been working, like some guitar riffs that were making sense. And like, if you got any lyrics to it, yeah, I said, well, no, but I got these. Well, we're going to go down to McDonald's and grab some fries and stuff. And uh, by the time we get it back, maybe you'll have lyrics. Well, I'd have two songs done by the time they get back. You know? <laughs> yeah. It just, that's the way it was. Right. It, it just, there was not a problem ever. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Uh, for me to write a song. Yeah. It's a gift for sure. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a talent. I believe brother. I, I don't think any of us are, are given gifts beyond others. I right. think all given se several uh, talents, but uh, but we can all give an increase with the talent we get, you know. No right, yeah, because you have to you have to learn your craft, even if you whatever talent you have, right? You have to work That's, on that. Amen. That's yeah. right. <laughs>
Um, so when did you guys, when you guys first got your deal, I know you released, I think if the first record came out in 69, but how long did it take you to actually get a record deal? What was that like for you? Did you had to play clubs for a long time or what was the process? No, we had, um, an opportunity came up through, uh, the attorneys in New York city that were Terry Knight's attorneys. They just happened to be doing the legal work for the first international a pop festival in Atlanta, Georgia, and they called it Atlanta gotcha. Pop. And it was 1969, and they struck a deal with the promoters of this concert uh, and gave them a, a good uh, a bargain on their rate. Uh, if their band, Grand Funk Railroad, could go on first and uh, open the festival right. at noon. And a lot and, of bands were getting signed from those festivals in those days, right? The, the old Janis Joplin, like all those guys got signed for festivals. Yes, yes. Yeah. And because when you get that many people revved up, uh, when you get that many people's opinion, <laughs> right? Time, Not critics, but, up, but real people. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 yeah. So uh, what happened was Terry Knight got a, a deal, a production deal with Capitol Records. Then we signed with him. And he told us that the 6% that the band was splitting was more than the Beatles got. We went, wow, no kidding. We're getting more than the Beatles. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was the buzzword. Yeah. yeah, what he didn't tell us was the, the total contract was 16%. He right. was taking 10. The band was splitting 6. Then he was taking a management commission of our little measly 6%. Yeah. Oh, boy. I know and, it's 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 sort of like the old story, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I was 20 years old, and uh, and my mother had to sign on the dotted line because I wasn't legal, right? And I I still say even though as many times as it's gotten me screwed, as they call it in the business, <laughs> yeah. or you know, taken advantage of, I am not going to stop being a nice guy, brother. That's awesome. I am not going to stop it. In fact, it even provokes me to be nicer. I'm exactly the same way. <laughs> Good man. Yeah, because you know, you, you, I like about you right off, Daryl. Because the thing is, otherwise, you end up being a, a bitter person sitting in a hotel room, angry at the world. It's like, what? You waste your life doing that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, brother. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so, you guys, you guys really were successful right out of the gate. I mean, your first couple of records went gold and multi-platinum. I mean, which is amazing. Yeah, the we already had the audiences because we had been playing uh, festivals. We did uh, Texas International in, in Louisville, Texas. And we did out in Oklahoma, man, this pop festival. I was out there. You know, I played with no shirt on. I'm out there <laughs> on this stage all of a sudden across Oklahoma on this sunny day right there was a snowstorm oh yeah <laughs> it, it was the craziest thing it was a big old snowflakes yeah. uh, but but all of that was uh it made it even that much more memorable and even uh you know you to commemorate that we'd go one step further you know <laughs> you know, like, yeah uh, like that's awesome it, Many Woodstocks they were. Yeah, it's cool too because you guys were like a power trio. I mean, you were sort of like this is way before that was really not as common, right? Yeah. Well, we had in the in the business, you know, you had Cream yeah. and Jimi Hendrix, and uh, you know, th th the three piece. Uh, I don't know uh, if Rush was then. <laughs> Or, I think yeah, maybe Rush was early seventies. I actually have to look, <laughs> but I know yeah. they've been around forever for a long time. Yeah. But, uh, was Rick, was Cream and those bands were they like in Jimi Hendrix? Was that were they heroes to you guys? Were they influences for you? Well, they that first uh, Fresh Cream, you know, mm -hmm. by by Cream, right? That was man, that was an album. And yeah. we, my friends, my guitar playing friends, and I would listen to that because what a tone on Clapton's axe, man, that, yeah. that was, and I don't understand why he departed from that tone and went a different direction when that first album was the one that made him yeah. famous, successful. And uh, it, it was, uh, you know, the magic, but 
but besides Clapton, I I really liked uh, the Yardbirds when Jeff Beck was in the group, and I saw right. them at Flint, Michigan, and he he set his Telecaster on its edge on the stage, and he's doing the this thing with his arms, you know, and yeah. the, the thing is feeding back, making all wheel bomb, yeah, it's just going crazy. Like this guy's now. from Mars, <laughs> yeah. and the audience was digging it so hard. I was taking notes, you right. know, thinking, oh, this is what they like to see a little show. And because I was in Dick Wagner's show band, I did know they like to see antics and the things that we did. Right. Uh, but I learned as I went along and Terry Knight was a great teacher as far as, uh, you know, a manager teacher uh, to get me to to exaggerate my moves so that the people in the back of the place would see them too, instead of little, uh, subtle moves nuanced I, right. doing dynamic moves and the bigger the better and uh so yeah okay we'll we'll try that <laughs> yeah because you guys were i mean you guys got to the point where you're playing uh large arena stadiums i mean huge huge venues right yes all the time and and uh we became known as you know like the first stadium band and yeah but they called it they crossed us up with uh they said we're heavy metal and metal and all and then different <laughs> yeah. and what pigeonhole will they put you in next you yeah, know because they always try to find a category to shove you into right <laughs> yeah, yeah dude but i i like to think of it as just a good old homegrown flint michigan assembly line rock and roll when you have like songs like some kind of wonderful and, and all the hits that you guys had What's it like, like when you, when you first start, that first starts really hitting and selling, um, what, what's that ride like? It must be just pretty crazy, I would imagine. And plus, you're, you're young, right? You're kids, kind of, in a way. Yeah, I mean, 1975, I was uh, 26 years old. Yeah, which, yeah. which is, yeah. I mean, nowadays, when we're at our age, I, I don't, you're, you're, you got a few years on me, but a 26-year-old <laughs> is, like a, is like a baby, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's funny yeah, but but to hear that on a radio and to 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 see the response to it in live concerts right and how everybody likes to sing it and uh it's easy to take advantage of that space when that song is on because everybody wants to be involved in it and, exactly uh, yeah so I, I, that's one of the ones I take my guitar off and I'm dancing around, dude. I'm like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I was I watching some TV, TV clips last <laughs> night. And I was like, Oh, he's okay. Cause I'm so used to seeing you with the guitar. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. But, that's uh, great. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the, your, your dream as a young musician to hear your stuff on the radio. But then when it's, when it's heard and then it's, it's going, it's like a hit, man, this is, there's nothing better, really, for a yeah. musician, young musician to to be accepted like that. Holy crap. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, if that song's never gone away, it's still, I mean, daily on the radio, I, I would say, probably around the world. Yeah, and John Ellison, who is the writer of Some Kind of Wonderful, he told me that that song has been recorded uh, by other people more than any other song ever recorded by other people wow some kind of wonderful is like number one that's that, amazing i got to hand brother john his award at the west virginia music hall awards and after i handed him his, his award he invited me out on the stage to sing some kind of wonderful with him and i took the second verse Wow. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's, I mean, it's, it's sort of like you guys, when you have a hit like that together, it's really, you're, you become family the rest of your lives, right? And you're connected. Yes, we are. Uh, we call each other all the time. He'll be over in Toronto or he'll be in Italy or he'll be in Florida and he'll call. And, hey, how you doing, brother? We're bone soup brothers because we, we really talk in soul food when we get on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> talking what tastes good you know? yeah no, I'm, I'm always talking barbecue with my, my buddies <laughs> well, yeah. you gotta taste some of brother john's some kind of wonderful chicken hey yeah I, i'm <laughs> down with that <laughs> that's awesome so you you i mean obviously with with what's been going on with the COVID situation you guys have not been touring 
Yeah. Um, but you've been releasing um, products and, and not products, but I should say, but you have a video release, uh, you have a DVD release. Um, and then you've actually for years now, you've been touring with your own band. Um, tell us about putting that band together. I know it's a lot of Michigan guys. And there's, it's amazing how much talent is in Michigan. And it, and there's always been so many great musicians coming out of there, right? Yes. I think the the pool that we have to dip into as far as musicians came from all the people moving to Michigan to get jobs in the auto factories. And right. they came like my mother's side of the family. They came from Leithville, Arkansas. They came from Mississippi, from Louisiana, Georgia, the Carolinas. And they all moved up to get jobs in the auto factories. And when they moved north, they brought their axes with them, brother. They brought their instruments. And north meets the south in Michigan. We didn't have this racial discrimination. We had acceptance. And yeah. we had brotherhood. And we had good community. And this is why we had the good music uh, to come out of here. You know, as far as my opinion, just because the auto factories got up and left doesn't mean our good people did. The families are right. still here. We still got some good Michiganders and a, a good pool of musicians to dip from. Yeah. And it's, I mean, like, there's such a long list of great, great players, great singers. And uh, so when you put your, your your band together now, is it, it's guys from, are they kind of from Detroit or just from around that area? Yeah. Two of my players are out of Detroit. And that is the bass player, Paul Randolph, who was also a uh, bass player on the Alice Cooper session uh, at Rust Belt Studio. That's where I met Paul uh, to doing that Alice Cooper record, the uh, Breadcrumbs record. Right. And, uh, and so I got, I got to know him, got to hear him, got to sing with him. And he is in my band now. The, and, you know, he's a roving reporter. Uh, he's he's a great musician hmm. uh, and also from Detroit we got Bernie Palo on keyboards and I met Bernie when I was out with Alto Reed who was Bob Seeger's uh, horn player right. which yeah. got rest his soul um, but we did a lot of gigs together um, and I heard you know uh, to heard him play in and I asked him hey can you do a keyboard gig for me I mean it'd be a lot easier for me to pick guys out of my home state here. Yeah, it's just easier for rehearsing and all that yeah. stuff, yeah. Yeah, and flying out. But there's one exception that we make, and that's to Hubert Crawford, a drummer, who's out of Memphis, Tennessee. And I met Hubert when we were doing a good gig in Montgomery, Alabama, and the bill was James Brown, War, and Grand Funk Railroad. Yeah, that's a, a good, that's a good lineup. <laughs> in a street festival wow. and man 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 and i saw hubert play and my son jason was with me on the road at the time and he said dad i think you and hubert are going to be playing music together i, I looked at him like are you crazy <laughs> but, <laughs> but we are and uh, awesome. i'm glad that i have this band uh, that we are playing from our our heart our spirit yeah. and we all, we all believe uh, in love and, and we work for love together side by side and uh, we won't work for anything else. Yeah. Our devotion is to love and to setting people free, helping to get this world right. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of negativity. So it's nice to bring the love and, and bring the good vibes. Yeah, man. Yeah, people people need that. I mean, that's the thing. I think what music's always been the glue for us as not only as Americans, but just as humans. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely, brother. Yeah, yeah I'm with you. Um, I, you so you have uh, a new song out. Tell us about the new song and a new video. That, that was well, I think it was. It's already been released in March, right? Well, the it's not released until April sixth. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, but. Uh, Never and Always is one of the bonus videos that is on this DVD, Mark Farner's American Band from Chile with Love. Okay. There is that, that uh, Never and Always, and then there's uh, Rock and Roll Soul, which is a, a free download right now. If people want to go to markfarner.com, they can download Rock and Roll Soul for free. Great. And this is also taken from this very same uh, DVD concert in Santiago, Chile. Hmm. Uh, but there's five other 
bonus tracks on this DVD as well. And one of them is Never and Always. So we got the audio version and the video version, uh, but Never and Always was just, just the song with no video until the guy who heads Abysmo Film, uh, mm -hmm. Carlos Toro, he heard this song and it, and it pulled his heartstrings. And he asked my manager, Abby Steinman, he said, can I uh, present a video to Mark of this song? I have this vision of this song uh, and I would like him to see it. It won't cost him anything to look at it. And so I said, yeah, man, go ahead. And look what he did with it. Look yeah. what he did with it. Oh. I'll tell you, Mark, like I was watching that last night. We were talking a little bit before we started. I mean, not only is the song great, your vocals are, I mean, killer. Really, really great. Um, but the whole vibe of the video is cool. And you was like, I, I was thinking Detroit. You said, no, it's Santiago Chile. I'm like, yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's awesome. Like, And it's nice to collaborate, right? I think that's also been a big part yes. of your career yes. in general. Yes. It's, it's better, uh, you know, I'm not saying like it's more of a reward, but it's just for at this point in my life for me to corroborate or, you know, and, and go along with and, and, and stretch my imagination and, yeah. and, and cause things to, to fit, you know, it, it just, it's a good exercise uh, in peacemaking. <laughs> yeah well you know what i mean that's part of what we do as musicians unless you're a solo artist our whole lives are collaboration with bands with artists with labels that's, that's it's right. all it's that's all part of that yeah you gotta learn how to schmooze brother <laughs> yeah and and get along right because you're your touring you got to be able to get along with people <laughs> yes yes <laughs> uh, you did i uh, went that one of the really interesting things you also did was you, you were in ringo's band right the all-star band yeah uh, how did that come about well, my manager uh, asked me if I wanted to go out with Ringo. I said, what are you talking about? He says, man, um, David Fishoff, who, who right. is the uh, you know, inventor and the owner of a rock and roll fantasy camp, he did a lot of Ringo's first tours. And it was his idea to come up with this all-star band. And uh, I jumped on it, man. I said, yeah, I would love to play with that band because, I mean, Randy Bachman. Yeah. Uh, you know, Billy Preston. Yeah, and I played with Billy. I toured with Billy. <laughs> Felix Cavalieri, John yeah. Entwistle, God rest his soul. Those boys, I mean, you know, Preston and Entwistle were right. special. They were special people, anyways. Yeah. And so uh heaven had it had to kick it up a notch when those boys walked in. For real. Yeah. 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 Billy used to do um, he used to do Amazing Grace by himself. I don't know if he did that with you guys. And oh my God, I would just stand there and watch that and chills up my spine. It was so good. Amazing. Yeah. I never heard him do it, but I can imagine. Yeah. Did, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Like how how long did you do the Ringo thing with that with that band? I just did it for the year. We did. Uh, we started off in Japan. We did 18 days there, and then we came to the United States and finished out over here. But Ringo was so pissed off, man, when he got to the when we got to the U.S. Somebody had already released a bootleg video of our gig at the Budokan. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, because because people they love that all those guys. Like it's hard not to <laughs> I know that's that's the technology thing we were talking about. It's like technology's great, but then again, with somebody's cell phone is right. as good as a video camera, as as good as a major yeah. motion, you know. Uh -huh. it, it's it's Absolutely. it's it's tough. So when you filmed the actually the, the DVD that you just did that's gonna be released, uh, the one from from Chile, uh where did you film that? How many days did it take to film it? What was that? Was that for fun for you or was that process? Yeah. It was just one date. It was just that one night. And it was uh, at Teatro Cal Palican. It's, mm -hmm. it's a big, you know, a rock theater <laughs> in the round with the audience very much a part of what you're doing. Every right. person, every person. It's wow. <laughs> yeah. Man. You know, what's funny about that, and we were talking about the audiences down there, what a lot of people don't realize is when we see live concert videos, very often they're filmed in either Brazil, South America, or Italy, or Spain, because the audiences, the Latin audiences, yeah. are just crazy, right? <laughs> they appreciate it to a greater degree uh, for, for whatever reason. It is obvious. Yeah. It is 
obvious, then who wouldn't want to be adored like that? What musician <laughs> wouldn't want that kind of adoration? I'm telling you. Yeah, and it's just nice to be, I mean, it's, it's great. I know it, it's somebody had said a long time ago that it's a blessing and a curse to have a huge hit because you better really make peace with the fact that you're going to be playing that song for the next 40 years. <laughs> so it's nice to get the reactions, right? Yeah, yeah, good words. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk to, let me talk a little about, um, you're also a Christian artist, and I know yes. that's a big part of your life. Tell me a little bit about how that happened for you. And was that, was that something that happened along the way, or were you always? Well, like when I was nine years old, my dad died, and Billy Graham was doing a, a crusade in Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Just before my dad died, he bought our first television. He was a city fireman in uh, Flint, Michigan, and he worked 24 and 48 hour swing shifts. So when he was home, he, he had to sleep, you know, a lot. Right. Uh, so anyways, he bought us this television and then him and a fellow uh, fireman were hit broadside by a train crossing a track and it killed them both instantly. They were in a oh, I'm sorry about that. Chevrolet. Thank you. Uh, but because I was, I didn't want to be in the dining room where my family was all mourning and crying and you're just, it was a sad room to be in. Sure. So I, I walked, I kind of went through the knees and stuff and walked out into the living room and there Billy Graham was doing this crusade. And he says, if there's anybody that needs a touch from God, if there's anybody who's hurting, if there's anyone who needs their soul lifted and man, everything he was saying, I'm thinking, oh, holy shit. Is like, he I need all that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah, I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm looking around and I'm, I'm the only one in there. And so uh, he says, if, if you're in need, put your hand on the television set and let's, let's pray. So I walked over and I put my hand on that television set and I prayed with Billy Graham. Now the, the revelation within myself, the spiritual revelation didn't come except a piece came to me that I couldn't explain as a nine-year-old kid. I can't tell you. I just knew it was okay. I, there's nothing I could do about it at this point. I'm right. nine years old, you know. Uh, we didn't go to church except on Easter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, that, that, that was our family too, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, later on in life, uh, you know, I get married in, you know, 1978 to Lisa and we're uh, having a great life. And you know, I bought a um, sawmill and I sawed up a bunch of lumber and built a 4,000 square foot log home that we moved into oh, awesome. a little place in the woods. And so, uh, and I thought we were pretty comfortable in there, but I was, go I was out on the road um, and then coming back and she was having to take care of the kids and I'm gone out on the road. It's, it's pretty tough for her. So when I got home and I, I had a couple of weeks home, uh, I got, I come home to a note one night and she was gone. My wife. Wow. And, so I, I went, Oh my God. Uh, and then I, at first I said, you know, it's this macho thing is, ah, she can't make it without me. I'm, you know, I'm, right. her, I'm, I'm the father of these children. She, she'll come to, but man, I'm telling you after a few days and nothing's happening, I start going to churches. I'm looking for God because when I was sitting at my dining room table, dude, I have, I'm about halfway through a 12 pack and, yeah. and I look over and this leaded glass window that's in the corner of the log cabin opened up like, like the corner of the room had little jagged edges and i saw myself on my knees in front of that television set with my hand like this up yeah. on the tv and i i said i need god holy crap i mean it, it was like i this and it wasn't the beer it wasn't those <laughs> six beers <laughs> so I, that's what got me looking in churches when I, I went the first place I went it was like hellfire and brimstone <laughs> yeah. was coming from and I just got up and walked out of places like that right and, you know I walk in with a headband on and a Hawaiian shirt and faded jeans yeah and, like who's who's the hippie <laughs> right right uh, 
but that was part of my test back then to, yeah. to if they could get past that you know then maybe i would i could uh, fit in right. but i there was a lot of places i didn't fit in but i finally got into this little church where this guy was preaching on the institution of marriage according to god's word and how mm. people walk out the front door of the church and they leave the whole ceremony there in the church they don't implement it in their life yeah they don't live it they yeah. don't follow through with their promise to one another yeah and and it's like he had a gun out and every shot was hitting me bang bang, bang. there was <laughs> yeah. no blanks fired that morning i'm telling you he was hitting me yeah because so, it must have been i mean that your whole life and uh, being on the road you're famous really yeah. famous yeah you got all these people throwing themselves at you and then but you come home and then you need that you need your home. You need your family. Yeah. So it's yeah. like trying to figure all that out. And then there's all these guys around you doing drugs and drinking and it's trying to navigate all that's gotta be really hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And circumnavigate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I went up when the guy was done with his sermon and I told him, I said, it was just like, I walked in here. I think God put me in your church this morning because I needed to hear that. And I told him the story about my wife. <clears throat> and uh, I said, uh, can, can we pray that I can get her back? I asked this, this preacher. He says, son, you pray, I'll agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I prayed in my words, and yeah. I just asked God to bring her back to me. I said, I love her. I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, she's my, she's my life. Yeah. So that day make a long story short she gave her life to jesus 50 miles away in another city and i don't wow. call that ha happenstance i call that divine appointment and uh and we have been back together after two days after that encounter uh we got back together and have been ever since and we will stay together until we depart the bone suit because <laughs> Cherokee men esteem their wives to be equal with themselves. Right. That's a smart man to be equal with themselves. If you raise yourself up even a little bit over that woman, that is, there's going to be an unhappy marriage. Yeah. It has to be equal. You have to live on the same plane. You can't have two checkbooks. You got to have one life. And it's got to be in love and it's got to be wide open in front of everybody yeah. and things will be great and people will learn from you. But if you're covering your shit up and blocking this and trying to protect something or saving a little bit, something for, for yourself in case this other doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Get rid of that. Living, living your life on the contingency plan. <laughs> yeah. We'll call it that. <laughs> uh, what's your, uh, and thanks for that, telling us that story, Mark. I know it's all personal stuff, but I think it's important for people to know, like, it's more than just music. You're living, you're a human, you're life. Yeah. You know, we're not, you're not just a famous musician. You're, you have, a, you have a life, you have a family. It's important yeah. for people to know that, especially yeah. younger guys, you know, younger people try to make it. Yeah. Uh, um, what, what's your advice for, for musicians, for, for maybe young singer, singer songwriters? What's like the most important things you learned along the way? The most important thing is to believe in yourself and to, to do it to whatever you're doing. If you're drumming, playing bass, keyboards, the uh, guitar, singing, what, you know, whatever you're doing, you have to do it for yourself and you have to be able to do it and progress because this is going to make you happy to, to hear yourself progress. And that's, what's going to keep you in touch with your instrument. And together you will be one voice that speaks your heart. Uh, but that it comes with the use of that instrument. It comes with the use of your voice. It comes uh, with participation because if you don't develop that, and, and let yourself go to it. It's in the spirit. It's like when you close your eyes or something calling to you, you got to let yourself go there. Don't do it for the open glory, open reward. Do it for yourself, do, for your heart, where you go to, to pray. Do it from that spot right there. And, and you'll be good and you'll be successful. Yeah. And I, that's the thing, like I always tell people too, like if you're doing it for the money, 
you're in the wrong business. <laughs> like you got to do it like you believe. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, you've been really highly successful. I've been pretty fortunate, but it's like, I would still do it even if I wasn't getting paid. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. That that's, that's a good lesson. That's a good life lesson. I think in general, right? Yeah, brother. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mark. I know, I know we, we could literally do hours with you because there's so much history and yeah. uh, I'd love to down the road. Hopefully we'll get a chance to meet in person and maybe we can do a follow-up interview once we get past all this stuff that's been going on. But, um, you know, bless you for like staying positive and, and, and embracing positivity. I think that's really awesome that that's, that's your philosophy. Thank you, brother Harris. I appreciate that so much. I take that as the encouragement and I know, uh, it's from one heart to another. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We all know the guys that aren't, aren't happy in their own life. And it's unfortunate because when you're successful, you just, you got to be so fortunate. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't, right. it, it's so rare, right? It's, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. How can people find you, Mark, online? You have a, uh, can you repeat your website again? Yes, it's markfarner.com. And to, for all the people that would uh, pre-order this DVD from Chile with Love, you can pre-order at markfarner.com or Talk Shop Live, the rock and roll channel, uh, has this order uh, as well. But $3 from each DVD goes to Veterans Support Foundation, which is an organization of veterans, by veterans, for veterans, no red tape, no hanky-panky uh, involvement. These guys get the job done. Transitional housing, they help vets to... Uh, get the money that they are due to get what they have coming to them legally by law. See, people will advocate in front of the, the board of foreign affairs. Uh, you know, the veterans have an advocate yeah. in this organization, the Veterans Support Foundation. And if I could mention the 800 number in case somebody, somebody that needs a little help, it's 800-882-1316. That's toll free 800-882-1316, Veterans Support Foundation. Yeah, and we'll include all that information in the podcast uh, sure. information, and I'll include sure. it on the video also. And we love our vets. I'm a big supporter of our veterans. And, uh, Good man. And I'm, I work with the Warriors Oasis um, in New Mexico, which is a, a retreat for PTSD sufferers. Awesome. So, yeah, so I, 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 that's close to my heart as well. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. Um, and I really look forward to seeing you in person somebody down the road <laughs> once we get going. <laughs> Myself too, brother. Okay. Uh, been good to, to be here with you. God bless you. God keep you. And if I don't see you in the future, I'll see you in the pasture. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> All good. Thank you so much, Mark. My pleasure. All right. Have Bye. a great day. Bye.